Hello and welcome to our video on concepts in Mishnayot Shabbat. Today we're going to learn Mishnah concept number six and Mishnah concept number seven. Now really, you may think they have nothing to do with each other. However, in the next Mishnah that we're going to learn, you will need to know these two concepts. You'll need to know concept number six, that the Rabbanan, meaning the sages who wrote the Mishnah, decreed that a Jew may not ask a non-Jew to work for him on Shabbat with certain exceptions. Now, let me just explain. Of course, we know that we often see in our communities um, Jews asking non-Jews to work, do something for them on Shabbat. These are the exceptions. Exceptions for, are definitely situations where there are life-threatening or even illnesses or even where you're worried about an illness. For example, if the heat went off and we're worried people will get sick from the cold. So you can ask the non-Jew to turn on the heater. If the air conditioning went off on a very hot day and there's a problem that somebody could uh, catch a heat stroke, or little kids could uh, be very, very hot, Right? When it's a situation that's for sure danger or even extreme discomfort, there is room for leniency in asking non-Jews to help the Jew. However, for things like, hey, go open my store and sell merchandise for me, or I need something delivered to uh, so-and-so, um, that is not a reason why we should not be asking non-Jews to do those type of things, because the Chachamim realized that basically a Jew would end up himself not resting on Shabbat. He won't do any work, but he'll be ordering around his workers all day with his business, and he will not end up having a day of rest. So therefore, even though non-Jews are not technically forbidden from doing work on Shabbat, the rabbis made this fence for the Torah, telling Jews not to be having non-Jews do work so that we will still have a day of rest. Okay? And of course, if, any, if you have any specific questions on that, consult your, your LOR, your local Orthodox rabbi, for specific guidance. Are you allowed to ask a non-Jew to do something in a certain situation? The next concept that we're going to come across is the concept of marit ayin. Marit ayin means appearance. You cannot do something which will make other people think that we are doing a sin. Even if we are not, even if the thing that you're doing is totally okay, you can't do something which other people will have a hard time figuring that out. This is called marit ayin. So the common example that we all know, right, if you're eating a meat meal, right, and you want to have some, uh, you know, fake um, cheese, like soy cheese with that meal, the Shulchan Aruch says that we should be putting um, the package on the table so people will know we should put, um, for example, when someone has almond milk, the Shulchan Aruch says you should put some almonds there together with your meat meal. So people who are seeing that and it's not normal to see that, they will realize, oh, it's not milk and meat that they're eating together, they're just, it's almond milk. Right? Now, the rules could be different in different situations. You should ask your local Orthodox rabbi, what if everybody knows? It's a common thing, like tofuri ice cream, like here and there. But this is the general rule. If you know that someone is going to suspect that you're doing an Avera, you should not do this without letting them know, being clear, that what you're doing is not an Avera. And now we're going to turn to page 26 in our Mishnayot, and we are going to read the Mishnah. Now we're going to understand what the Mishnah is saying. Beit Shammai Omrim. Beit Shammai says, Ein mochrin, you cannot sell something, le'oved kochavim, to a non-Jew. In this case, the non-Jew is an idol worshiper, but any non-Jew. Ve'ein to'anini mo, and you cannot load with him, meaning if he has a donkey, and you're loading up your merchandise on his donkey, on your property. The ain magbi in love, you cannot 
put something on his shoulder. Ella, unless unless there is enough time before Shabbat for the non-Jew to travel on the road and reach a close location before Shabbat. In other words, if it's like two minutes before Shabbat and everyone knows that he's going to hit, get on the road and he's going to be traveling on Shabbat, you should not be loading up his donkey or giving him merchandise or selling him things. Why? Let's think. Mishnah concept number six and number seven. Raise your hand if you can figure out what could be two problems over here. So, if you said that the reason Beit Shammai does not allow it is because people may think that you're doing something wrong, which this is the connection to Mishnah concept number seven, right? We're not allowed to do marit ayin and make people think we're doing something wrong. What could they possibly think you're doing wrong? Our commentaries explain Beit Shammai is worried that people may think you told the non-Jew to go and travel for you on Shabbat, maybe on business or a delivery or whatever, and they won't realize that you sold it to him and it's his and he's traveling for himself. Okay, so even though you're not technically doing anything wrong, Beit Shammai is worried that people will suspect it so they don't allow it. However, Beit Hillel Matirin, Beit Hillel allows it. He's not concerned because Beit Hillel holds that we don't go that far in our decree about Marit Ayin, which you'll uh, look into more if, if you study the Gemara. Next Mishnah. Beit Shammai Omrim, Beit Shammai says, and we're going to get right now into Mishnah concept number six about telling a non-Jew to work for you on Shabbat. Arot. You cannot give leather, le'abdan. An abdan is someone who is a tanner, who is working the leather to make it processed. Velo kelim, and not vessels, or in this case we're talking about clothing, like your laundry. Le'koves oved kochavim, to a non-Jewish Laundryman, Ella Kadeshe Asume Baod Yom, unless there is enough time for them to finish the laundry during the day before Shabbat begins. What's the problem? Because Beit Shammai is concerned what if the non Jew continues working on your clothing on Shabbat? It will be like he's doing it on your behalf. In all of these situations, Beit Hillel says, as long as the sun didn't go down yet, you're allowed to give the clothing to the non-Jewish laundryman. Now, you don't have to, you don't have, you're not telling him to do it on Shabbat. If, if you told him to do it on Shabbat, Beit Hillel wouldn't allow it either. Means that you gave it to him and you're letting him do it whenever he wants. You're going to pick it up. You'll tell him, I'll pick it up sometime on Monday. Right? So then he can work on Sunday or he can work on whatever. He can work on Friday. Whenever he wants, he doesn't have to work on Shabbat on your behalf. So but he'll allows you to drop it off right before Shabbat. Mishnah Tet. Am Rabbi Shem Ben Gamliel. Rabbi Shem Ben Gamliel says, Now again, how you Beit Abba, in my father's home, the custom would be, Shehem Notnim Kle Lavan, they would give white clothing, which is very hard to clean because it has stains could show up and it would take a long time. The koves oved kochavim to a non-Jewish laundry. Shlosha yamim kodem shabbat They would give it three days before Shabbat because they knew it takes a long time and they don't want to, um, they don't want the non-Jew to be working on Shabbat for them. Vishavin elu ve'elu. Both Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel are in agreement. Shatoanin korot Beit Habad. You can put a beam on a press. Ve'igule hagat and igule hagat, the round stones on another type of press. We're going to show you pictures in a moment. What's going on over here? Let me explain. Basically, the, there is a malacha, one of the 39 malachot you're not allowed to do on Shabbat is dash, which is threshing or squeezing out 
liquid from fruit. So, obviously, they will not allow you to squeeze the fruit out on Shabbat. And obviously, Beit Shammai already told us that he doesn't let your machines do the work, so you can't even set up an electric machine or a mechanical machine to be squeezing out your olives or grapes. What's going on over here? The commentaries explain that the custom was that after you press your olives or grapes, it's already done, the job is already finished before Shabbat. They would wait, they would have a, a bowl, or you see over here, there's a, um, some type of a receptacle here to catch the juice. It's already been pressed, and they would just leave it over Shabbat, the juice flowing out. Now, Beit Shammai wouldn't have a problem with that, because the work is already finished before Shabbat. So why are you putting the beam on there? Not to press it, the pressing has already been finished, just to help the juice get out of all the, um, you know, the bags of olives to help the flow of the olive oil or the, or the, or the grapes. So basically, both Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel are allowing you not to press your olives or grapes on Shabbat, but to put a weight on top of it so that it would help it flow out, which that is not the work of threshing or dash, because that was already done before Shabbat began. One more picture to help us understand this halakha. So here is a picture of someone uh, squeezing grapes in the good old uh, days before modern presses, right? They put it in a pit there and step on it until they squish them all up um, so that all the juice, the wine, flows out, right? So that was done before Shabbat. And then the worker puts heavy stones on top of this already squashed grapes just to get the wine to flow into the other receptacle during Shabbat. So in other words, the squeezing was done before Shabbat, and he's putting the stones there to help the flow of the wine out. Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel both allow that.